Okay, a bonus point to those of you who know what a logical clock is. Um, right, so I'm, I'm going to talk about the, the, the coolest tool or platform of 2019, the Feature Store. And I'm going to talk a bit about why it's very Python-centric and how it enables data engineers and data scientists to interact a bit. A little bit about us first. Um, I'm based in Stockholm. And uh, we're uh, a vendor of an open source platform called Hopsworks. It's a data platform for AI. And I thought I'd say something a little bit topical, because Sweden, as many of you know, is a very gender neutral country. And uh, I thought I'd show you how we solve the problem in Sweden. So I've been living in Sweden for 15 years. I teach in Swedish, so I feel kind of Swedish. Um, we've changed the pronouns. We didn't like he and her. And now in the schools, we, we, we get he in Swedish is han. And her in Swedish is hon, so we actually use a gender neutral pronoun called hen, or in English, hen. <laughs> so if you're going to a hen party in Sweden, it could be anything. It could be anything. <laughs> it's a box of chocolates. Just remember that. And remember, in 20 years, this is what, hey, what it was. OK. So what I'm going to start is by um, motivating the feature store. So you're interested in becoming a data scientist. You think it's great. I love working with uh, Python. <laughs> You know, I might earn a big salary, and I might even get a chance to change the world. You could start as a very motivated individual. You've got your toolkit. You've got Jupyter Notebooks. You've got Python, PyTorch, Pandas, NumPy. You might even have Spark and TensorFlow. Uh, and then you get into the real world of the enterprise, the large companies. And you come into this big sea of systems down below, data systems. And you know, this might not be your cup of tea. You, know? you say, well, you, know, you employed me as a data scientist. but they're paying you big bucks. You should know all this. You should know how to use uh, Google BigQuery and, and Amazon S3 and HDFS and so on. So really, one of the problems that data scientists have, and we experience this a lot when we come to banks and, 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 and large companies, is that data scientists have difficulties finding their data. They have difficulty, even when they find the data, of getting that data into a format that they can use to train models. Um, and we often have the cliche that 80% of the work is actually you know, doing the data prep and getting it out there. So as you may guess, the, the feature store is motivated by this. We want to reduce the time that data scientists spend doing, uh, looking for data, munging data, feature engineering, and maximize the amount of time they do doing proper data science. And that's where the feature store comes in. So what it is, in fact, is a new layer of abstraction. And it's a layer of abstraction that separates your back-end data systems, and you'll have data engineers at the back-end systems writing what we call feature pipelines. And I'll explain why feature pipeline is not an ETL pipeline that you're familiar with. They're similar, but, and they may be also written in Spark. They might be written in PySpark. Um, but they're, they're different to the traditional ETL pipelines that, that people may be familiar with. And the goal of this is that we want to make the data scientist's life easier. Um, they can get ahead, do their modeling, and change the world one click through at a time. So I'll just jump in and show you an API, because people obviously want to show me the money, show me the code. This is how, in our particular feature store, we did the world's first open source feature store in Hopsworks. And this is how data scientists use it. Basically, they'll go to, uh, they'll go to this thing called the feature store. And we, I'll show you later on in, in a quick demo. But you have a flat namespace of features. And big companies like Uber have over 10,000 features. We have a bank uh, in Sweden. They have about 400 features. And that will grow over time. But the data scientists will go first and foremost to the feature store to see if the features are there to build their models. If they're not, they'll need to bring in a, a data engineer. Or if you're good enough, you can do it yourself. And what the data engineer will do is then uh, register new features in the feature store. So what the data scientist gets to do is pick the features they want to train their models with, and then generate the training data sets in the file format that they're interested in. And this is another issue that uh, crops up when you, when you come to large enterprises. You get People who like PyTorch, people who like TensorFlow. I want the training data in TF records. I want it in NumPy arrays. Um, you can even have more scalable formats like uh, Pedestorm uh, for parallel uh, data training. So with a feature store, it's trivial to create your training data and test data in the format that you want. So if you're a data engineer and you want to actually register a feature with this feature store, what do you need to do? Well, in our particular feature store, all you need is a data frame. By default, it's a PySpark data frame, but it can be a Pandas data frame. So you create a, a data frame with your engineered features, and then you just register it with the feature store, and it can be available then for data scientists to use it. So that's a quick overview. Now, 
Many of you will know what a feature is. I give this talk sometimes to data engineers, and I don't think we have many of them here. So um, they, they think a, data, a, a, a feature is often a column in a, in a data warehouse, in a table in a data warehouse. Well, we know that it's not, that typically features are computed. Uh, they may be aggregates, they may be windows if we're trying to do predictions of time series data or we're looking at transactions and fraud. Um, we often we use things like graph embeddings to predict fraud in, in anti-money laundering. Um, you know, if you're working with raw image data, sound data, uh, you'll consider pixels maybe features. Um, but we know that these features basically can come in many different formats and typically we need to compute them. It's not just data you pull directly from your data warehouse. So the feature store will not be just structured data you find in a typical data warehouse. So some of the problems we see with feature uh, engineering is that imagine there's a new cool pre-trained model called BERT that appears, and BERT is the state of the art for natural language processing now. So a lot of different uh, maybe organizations within a, a larger enterprise will decide they want to play with BERT, and they have some raw text that they'd like to, to, to use BERT to train uh, some, some prediction problem with. So what they'll do is they'll take the raw data, they'll write some code to engineer the features that BERT expects, this pre-trained model, and we'll have duplicated feature engineering work here. So the different teams will write the same code twice, um, maybe you know, worse in one place, better in another place, but there'll be no global enterprise level knowledge of what features are available in the organization. The other main problem that we see with feature engineering um, in when people put models into production is that you may write different code for implementing feature C in this example. So when you're training it, maybe you're computing windows and you know, you're computing your window and then when you, in your implementation, so you have an online service that needs these windows, maybe it's computing it slightly differently. Maybe you're computing the mean in one and the median in another feature. And this can cause obviously large problems in prediction of your deployed model. So feature implementations may not necessarily be consistent if you don't have a structured way of accessing your features. So what we want to do is we want to make these features available as first class entities in our platform, whatever your platform may be. Features should be discoverable. You should be able to reuse them across different uh, models that you're training. They should be access controlled, versioned, governed, and very importantly, they should be available to make your models reproducible. So you should be able to say, I would like to use this feature, this version, uh, when I, I use this feature in this version to train this model, and then you can use provenance to basically take a model and say well, which features were used, which versions, and you can go back and forwards that way. You also use the feature store as a way to, to reduce the time it takes you to train models. Because often when you're training models, you wait a long time to generate your training data. So the feature store can backfill a lot of the feature data. So you can have a job which is filling up the feature store every hour, keeping your windows up to date so that you don't have to recompute them when you want to do your training. Uh, and this is important for things that are computationally expensive, like aggregates, embeddings. Um, but for many people, they still want to do on-demand computation of features. It's not always going to be um, pre-computed features. So the, just a quote from Uber, who, who, who were the first people to write publicly about their feature store called Michelangelo. They basically said that the goal of the feature store for them was to solve the data problem uh, this 80% of your time doing data munging so that the data scientists won't have to solve the problem themselves. So um, I, the title of the talk was Data Engineering Meets Data Science. And the way we look at it as a feature store as an abstraction, you can think of it as an API, uh, an application programming interface. Data engineers will spend a lot of the time adding and removing features. They'll take the data from the different data stores, the raw data, and they'll make them available in the feature store. And data scientists, who maybe are, are Python experts, but not necessarily PySpark or even Scala experts, would like to just use those features to train models. And how this feature store fits in, in our particular case, how it fits into pipelines, because when you train a model and you want to use that model in production, the pipeline is the basic unit we have of deploying machine learning models. The pipeline is a way of reproducibly taking data, converting it into models, and making those models available for applications to use. So a typical pipeline will go from raw and st or structured data into features and the feature will be used to train models and those models will then be deployed and validated. And one thing that we also notice is that when you're serving models, you may have to access features. So, you know, if you're doing, for example, anti-money laundering and you get a transaction comes in, we train our model on 300 features. Those 300 features are not available in the model, in the transaction data itself. So we have to go look them up. We go to the feature store, we get the latest uh, features 
and this needs to be a low latency operation, and then we can then feed that feature vector to the, to the model to make the prediction. So there's two main um, use cases, you could say, of the feature store. One is the offline feature store. So when you're running batch applications or streaming applications, so these are applications that work on large amounts of data or big data. Uh, you may think of Spark applications, Flink, or Spark streaming applications as streaming applications. They're basically jobs that will run. So you can imagine, for example, you have a very large data set of users or customers, and you want to do a marketing job. So we want to go through all the users, score them, and then we'll, we'll basically send some marketing material or address different segments based on the scoring. So what you would do is you'd register your features um, that you're going to use to train this model with the feature store. Then you can create your training data uh, from those features. So you select those features you're going to use to train your model. Save the model. It's available now if it's sklearn, it's a, it's a pickled uh, Python object, or it's a, a PB file, protocol buffers file for TensorFlow. And then at a later stage, you're, you write a streaming app. And the streaming app is going to use that model to basically go through all of your users and then make a prediction as to what type of uh, marketing activity I want to make of this user based on the, on the score. So in that case, what you're going to do is you're going to get the, the, the job to compute those features based on these new users that you're supplying, get your model. In our case, we're using Cond environments. Um, I'll discuss that later on. And, but you could also have a Docker file if it's a different type of feature store. So that would be the environment that was used to, to train the model because you want to have the same Python dependencies when you're computing your features. And then finally, you can run the job. And in this case, it may be just an embedded model that you use for your predictions. And then you print out your results and, or use them for, for analytics. So it's a typically batch or streaming application use of the feature store. The other use of the feature store is if you, if you have online applications. So your online applications, if we look at the top right-hand corner, they're going to have some, some feature data come in. And they'll go to the feature store and say, please make a prediction, but you need to actually enrich this data because I'm missing some of the features. So then you'll go to the online feature store to, to add those new features that are missing, and then you'll get a response back uh, because the model will have made a prediction based on the full feature vector that you, you fed in. So the way you work with the online feature store is pretty similar to the offline feature store. You engineer your features, you, you register them with the off online feature store, uh, then your, your, your um, data scientists will create training data from those features, train models, deploy them. In this case, they're going to deploy them in models that are being served over the network. So in our case, we serve models on, on Docker containers on Kubernetes, so sklearn or um, uh, uh, Tensor uh, serving server for TensorFlow. So there's a bunch of feature stores out there, and um, we can see our one is up at the top, but it's, it's the world's first open source uh, feature store. But there are, other ones that have been announced by companies, very large companies, but they haven't been made public. The only one that uh, has some source code available is Gojek's uh, Feast system. It's, it's, it's tightly coupled to Google Compute Engine, so it's using Bigtable and BigQuery, um, but you can see the source code. The other systems have been announced by these companies, Airbnb, Comcast, Twitter, Uber, um, but they haven't released source code as of yet. So a few words about our feature store, and uh, maybe I'll get time for a quick demo. So we have a platform. It's called Hopsworks. It's a data platform for AI. So you can think of it as being a, a platform where you can store lots and lots of data, do compute jobs at scale. It supports batch analytics. So you would typically use Spark uh, to, to do uh, computations at scale. We have a data warehouse hive. Uh, we support streaming analytics with Flink or Spark streaming. And then for machine learning, the platform uh, the, you can see that the feature store is a key part of it, um, and, but we also do uh, model serving and uh, distributed model training as well. And uh, typically, all development is done in Jupyter Notebooks, which is quite uh, unique. So just to mot motivate this platform, many of you will have seen this slide. It's, it talks about complexity in training machine learning models in the real world. So in the real world, that little box in the middle is just a small part of the problem of training models. You have to collect your data. You have to validate your data to your feature engineering. We hide that away with the feature store. So the purpose of our platform is to make it easier to do deep learning, machine learning at scale on large volumes of data. So what we're doing is encapsulating a lot of these different components and systems that you require to do machine learning at scale behind the feature store, but also behind some APIs that I'll, I'll discuss in a second. So some of, the, some of the things that we do are things like distributed training, hyperparameter optimization, managing pipelines, serving models, and uh, monitoring models as they're being served. 
So I'll just give you one example of this, just to, to elucidate it. So we do support distributed deep learning, and we really do think that this is the time has come for distributed deep learning. Um, and the reason why is because it's just as easy to write code that will scale to lots of GPUs as it is to write it for a single uh, GPU. We are using Conda environments to uh, make sure that the same Python libraries that you install are available on all of the containers in your system. And this is based around something called PySpark. So if you haven't heard of PySpark, all you need to know is that PySpark has something called a driver which launches lots of executors, so up to N. You can have hundreds uh, of, or even up to 1,000 executors. So each of those could have potentially their own GPU. What we need to have then to make distributed deep learning work is you need to have a distributed file system because each of these executors will store logs, they'll store tensorboard logs, um, they'll, they'll have hyperparameters potentially and they need to uh, aggregate the results, they need to share the same training data, uh, they need to output their models, they need to have checkpoints that are available amongst all of them. Without a distributed file system, you have a nightmare of going to the local file systems of all your containers and getting your data out of them. So we do have a stack based around this. The, the platform doesn't just support AMD. We are also open source, or sorry, in NVIDIA, we are open source with AMD, which have Rock M. This is going to come out in the next few weeks. There was a talk at Spark Summit about this, if you're interested. And at the top level, how programmers pr write code is basically the writing Python code, but it's TensorFlow, PyTorch, Keras inside a PySpark. And that isn't as scary as it sounds, right? So this is the code. This is going to, you can do hyperparameter optimization on potentially hundreds of GPUs with this code here. So if we break this code down quickly, we can see that the driver is the main scope here, and all it's doing is specifying hyperparameters. We've addictive hyperparameters, and then we call this experiment.grid search. It's going to do grid search of the hyperparameters. And we have this train uh, object down here, which is really the method up at the top, def train. So this is going to call train on all of the executors. So if I start this with 10 executors, it'll start with 10. Each could have a GPU. Um, and I could start also with 100, or I could start it with just one. The code remains the same. So each executor will execute this piece of code. Now you may be confused and say, well, what if I have a data set in TensorFlow and I pass that in? Well, data, TensorFlow will automatically shard it for you. So each executor will um, get a shard of the training data to, to train on that. Um, so that's hyperparameter optimization. Training, you might say, is harder. It is a bit harder, but the code isn't that different. Again, your driver code is going to be just experiment dot some method name and then the, the function where we're encapsulating our, our distributed training code. And then the executors all run this particular function or this method here or function called train. Um, so what this will actually do, because it's collective all reduce, is it will build a ring amongst the executors who will share their gradients around the ring and it's doing synchronous uh, stochastic gradient descent. So getting back to the feature store, a little bit sidetracked there. Um, the feature store is, um, it basically consists of three new abstractions in our case. One is the features themselves. We have a flat namespace of features. But when we compute the features, we compute them in groups. So this is really related to what, how we have data frames. So if you have a data frame with lots of columns, each column is a feature and the feature group is effectively a data frame because we're registering data frames with the feature store. But then the interesting part is then you can generate training data from any of your feature groups. So you can pick a bunch of features from different feature groups. Uh, the system will do some query planning and look for a common key on which to generate the feature vectors. If there isn't one, you, you can supply one, but you will need a common key. So it might be, for example, the customer identity is common across all the feature groups. It might be time, that you're using time as, as, as your key. Um, but the, there is some intelligence in the system in terms of query planning there. So um, we do online monitoring, uh, uh, model serving, uh, as I said, for SKLearn and, and scikit-learn. Basically, your requests come in. You may need to go to the feature store to, to build on those, uh, to enrich those feature vectors. You make your predictions, and then we log the predictions. And in fact, when you're running a system in production, you do need to log your predictions because you want to monitor it. You want to monitor the quality of your predictions. So the way we do that is that the predictions get logged to Kafka, and then a streaming app like Spark Streaming can analyze those. And typically, what you want to do later on is you want to store those predictions, because maybe later on you'll find out the outcome. And if you find out the outcome, you can join it to the prediction, and it will help you both measure model performance, but also generate new training data. 
Okay, so do we, I said that we have something on, on pipelines. So here's a pipeline. This is our pipeline, and it's Python all the way. You start from your raw data, which arrives in, in, in Kafka. From there, you can use Spark or Flink. Um, Flink does support Beam and TensorFlow, if you're interested in um, TensorFlow Extended, uh, which we're working on, we haven't released yet. But uh, typically, we use Spark for the feature engineering. And then um, from there, we go to the feature store. Our feature store is built on uh, Hive, which runs on top of our file system, HopsFS, which is a, a faster version of HDFS. And then from there, we saw that, that we can distribute the training of our models and the experimentation of our models by putting our PyTorch or TensorFlow Keras application inside this PySpark function. And from there, we serve our models on Kubernetes. And then finally, we, 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 uh, we log the predictions from our models that are being served into uh, Kafka from where they can be read by applications. And all of this is orchestrated with Airflow. And if you're not familiar with Airflow, Airflow is an orchestration tool, again, programmed in Python. So the whole of this feature pipeline um, or this machine learning pipeline, end-to-end -end machine learning pipeline, uh, are programmed typically in Python, except sometimes feature engineering is done in Scala. But you can do it in Python. And what's interesting about our platform is we actually believe notebooks are the future, and we're not the only ones. Netflix are m writing most of their code on notebooks and running them in pipelines as well. So what we can do is we can take, write our code in Jupyter Notebooks, build a pipeline in Airflow, and then test it, and incrementally fix your notebooks and keep running the pipelines and testing your pipelines. So that we basically believe that data scientists should be writing production code, not writing some code and handing it over the fence to uh, someone else to re-implement. So this may be end-to-end -end pipelines, but more commonly what you would do is you would have one pipeline to fill up your feature store and another one to do training, and they might run at different cycles. So maybe you're going to update your feature data hourly or daily, and then the training will be done periodically when you're, either your models degrade or um, you decide to do it periodically. Uh, the feature store can be used as part of a, a, a you know, if you have a, a cloud platform and you just want the feature store and not the whole of our end-to-end -end machine learning platform, you can kind of do that. Um, I'll skip over that. And I'll just show you a quick uh, demo so that we can see what this kind of looks like. And this seems to work. Okay, great. So this is the platform here. Um, you can see there's like 21, 22 GPUs available. You can have like hundreds if you want. Um, I think I have a notebook. So from here, you can start notebooks and decide how many GPUs you want, how much memory and CPUs and so on. And this is the, uh, a notebook showing you the feature store. I'll try and make it a bit bigger so that people can see. Uh, this particular notebook is basically going to, you've seen this one before, it's taking house sale data and uh, it's looking at um, houses sold. So we have the data about houses that are for sale, houses that were sold, and we're going to introduce a new houses for sale data set and try and predict the price of them. So there's a lot of feature engineering going on here, and what's different is that once we've got down to our data frames, we can see our data frames down here, we're doing some feature engineering still. We can basically store them in the feature store. And this is what you do here. You basically say, save this data frame. Like I said, it can be a Pandas data frame or a uh, PySpark data frame. And then it will compute statistics for you, which is quite nice. So let's have a look at the statistics it'll compute. So this is not the one here. I want this one here. So these are projects, by the way. And feature stores are per project. So you can have many feature stores on the same platform. So this is the feature store, our particular feature store here. You can see that we have the flat namespace of feature names here, the feature types. I don't have any descriptions of them. And then the groups of features, and we have a job to compute the features. And then we can look at statistics for features. So this is computed automatically once you register it with the platform. You get your, um, uh, you can look at descriptive statistics, you know, mean, max, count, standard deviation. So basically data scientists go here, look at the features, look at the distributions of the feature values and try and understand them before they go off and build their models. So at this point, the data engineer is finished and uh, the data scientist will take over. The data scientist will basically decide, hey, I need to create a training data set. I'm going to pick some of these features. So they'll go back here to our feature store. They'll look through these features, search for them, find ones that they think are interesting. And in this case, we've decided that the features that are interesting are average house age, average house size, average house worth, average number of bidders, and average sold per features. And what we do is we just basically have, this would be a whole notebook, create a trained data set, and create it as TF records. But you could create it as NumPy uh, object if you liked. And then from there, you basically 
write your normal TensorFlow application if you like TensorFlow. One point about TensorFlow, if you're not familiar with it, is that TF records is very messy, and right, you typically have to define the schema in your code. But when you have a feature store, you can just go to the feature store and say, well, give me the schema for that TF record. Um, uh, and basically, you don't need to now write all that code into your uh, notebook anymore. And then from there, we can basically define a model, a training function, and launch it. So that's basically how the feature store integrates into our platform. Um, the one point I will ma mention about the platform that makes it different to every other platform is that uh, we do have Conda environments. For this particular project here, we have a replicated Conda environment at all the hosts. So you can basically pip install libraries here. So data scientists don't need to write Docker files. You can basically pip install, pip install, pip install. When you're happy and everything's fine and dandy, you get a, con a YAML file describing your uh, Conda environment, and that can be used in production um, to get your reproducible infrastructure. Okay, so that's, that's the quick demo over. And um, let's go back. So you can try this out. So um, it's, like I said, it's open source. And uh, we're doing lots of new things for it. Um, I'll show you on the next slide. It's hops.site. But we, ha we have a managed platform at the Research Institute in Sweden called RICE. We can give you access to it. If you register there, I'll approve your account. There's 23, 24 GPUs there that you can use. Um, but it's also open source, and you can just install it on Amazon or Google Cloud or on your own. It runs on-premise as well if you have your own cluster. So some of the things we're working on in terms of the feature store is things like data provenance. Uh, where we have some nice uh, new features on being able to track from a model to say which features we use to train it. And then you can look at features and say which ones are most popular uh, used in models. You can also clean up training data sets when they're no longer used by models that, that have been trained. And um, then we have some other Im uh, improvements in terms of how we use Hive as our back end. So like I said, if you go to that site, hops.site, and register this evening, I'll, I'll approve the account. You can try this out. Uh, we're, we're on Twitter. Uh, the platform is called Hopsworks. It is the Euro only European um, big data platform. And uh, we're currently the only one, at least I know, on premise who will uh, allow you to do training up to hundreds of GPUs on premise. Um, and that's, with that, I think I'll take questions. <laughs> if there's time. Yeah, we've got two minutes of questions. Uh, so if you've got a question, please use the mic uh, in front of you and push the button. I can repeat it. That's right, I've got one there. Yeah, hi. Um, can you have a stupid question? Can you have tags on the features that you're generating? So the question was, can you have tags on the feature that you generated? So the feature store does have metadata for the features. So you, we have descriptions of them and names for them, and they're effectively tags. So you can search through them. Yeah. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Um, I had a question about your data formats. Uh, I saw you mentioned TF records. Uh, if you could go into that a little bit more in detail, um, and also if there's what's behind it essentially on your uh, back end, if it's stored in columnar data, parquet, or um, if you're looking into sort of more um, cross platform data formats like Apache Arrow. Yeah, so, so Apache Arrow is not a file format. So, what, what I mean by file format is the the format of the data as it's stored on disk to be used by the machine learning uh, framework of choice. So if you're using TensorFlow, the native uh, file format for TensorFlow is TF records. And it's not a columnar data format in the sense that you can't say, hey, uh, like, so I'll give you an example. Uber uh, generate huge amounts of training data, tens of terabytes. And what they have is hundreds of features. So if they have that in TF records, they'd have to read all of that up. And then in memory, they drop the columns that they weren't interested in. That wasn't interesting to them, so they introduced a new format that, uh, that it called Pedastorm that we support there as well. That's a columnar format. TF Records is not really columnar in that sense. You can't select columns. Uh, NumPy is a native format for uh, PyTorch, and then you have HDF5 and CSV and a bunch of other ones. I mean, basically, it's to reduce the impedance mismatch between reading in the data, converting it to the format that the framework expects, and using it then natively. So the question is, do we store many or do we have one? We, no, we, you, you decide. You, you pick the features, and then you decide, this is the file format I would like, and then saves it in the distributed file system. 
Yeah. Uh, do, you, uh, do you offer this uh, as a platform as a service, and what is the pricing model? So if I want to have a cluster of GPUs, do I install the software on my own a cloud offering, like say S3, or yeah. do you have that as that cloud offering as part of your company's uh, product? Talk to me later. Yeah, sure. Okay, and, and the pricing model, if possible, as well. Yeah, but it's open source as well. But we do have an enterprise version or an enterprise kind of thing. Yeah. Hi, I was wondering what led to the choice of MySQL for the live feature store. Well, I, I would say it's features. not MySQL, it's actually NDB. You, you probably don't know it, it's a distributed nope. in-memory database and it's the basis of our, uh, our back-end file system. So our file system is the world's most scalable hierarchical distributed file system. It's HFS compliant. We get like 1.6 million ops per second on, on Spotify's Hadoop workload, and we do it with the help of this distributed in-memory database. We have papers at top use next conferences. You can read them up. It's called HopsFS. Cool. So Thank we you. do it because it basically maintains consistent metadata across all the services. Okay, we should uh, wrap up there. Thank you very much, Jim. Thanks. Thank you.